Thank you, gentlemen, for your graciousness and being willing to join us for this discussion. Now, none of our panelists have seen the questions that we're going to ask them this after or this morning. Uh, so it is my hope that I will be able to stump at least one of you with something. Uh, and my first question is for you, Pastor Travis. Uh, yesterday, you said in your sermon that you have a a limited amount of military experience. And I'm wondering, strictly speaking, is that true? It's true in every, uh, in every way that I could explain that. There, there's what we call the post-9-11 military and the, and the pre-9-11 military. And I was in the pre. Okay, so the... If the you know what I mean. Yes. The, I have questions about the adjective limited, though. <laughs> You were a Navy SEAL. So when you were talking about clearing out shoot houses and going after active shooters, that wasn't just something you read out of a book. I, I've read that out of books. Well, it wasn't <laughs> something you just read out of a book, right? I, I feel like there's a whole lot more profitable things we could be talking about. No, no, no. <laughs> Wait a minute. But, but here, here's the thing. I, I, I do think I'm sitting there listening to you, knowing your training, knowing your giftedness and things that you've been involved in, and you're talking about Jesus uh, operating in meekness with composure. He was a Navy restraint. SEAL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he's the true man. And so uh, it was moving to me knowing your background and helping us to think of Christ's meekness in light of that. That was incredibly helpful for me mm -hmm. as a pastor. I'm thinking back on times I blew it. You know, when I didn't keep my composure and I didn't use restraint. And so thank you, brother. Yeah, yeah, you're sure welcome. I think that um, when I say limited exposure, I, I'm not just, it's not just a faux humility. I really mean that, that, um, you know, I did those things. It's true. But there's just another level that the guys went to post 9-11. And so I'm just always kind of cognizant of that and, and have really appreciated the development that war has brought to clearing houses, clearing targets, and, and just watching uh, the guys develop, guys that I know, who are, they're true professionals. And to, uh, to see how they handle themselves in the midst of very stressful situations uh, Phil's, one of Phil's sons is on the LAPD, and he could testify to the same kinds of things he sees uh, in SWAT or Metro or, you know, the LAPD, just the officers and how they handle themselves. They don't get enough recognition and appreciation for that. There's a lot, you know, it's the worst stories that make it onto the news. But the guys, is a, just as a breed, you watch the way they handle stress and pressure and how they deal with people. One minute they can shoot a terrorist and the next minute they can take care of the terrorist family and tuck them away into safety, out of harm's way. There's a care that's shown for humanity. And so I think the people who are put into positions to either take or spare lives, um, they understand that. So yeah, when I watch when I watch the Lord Jesus operate, um, I, just, I just see him at a whole different level. Mm. So, um, Pastor Tom, when we think about this conference and uh, the, the theme of the conference, remember Jesus Christ, why, why that theme for this conference and why now? Yeah, well, that's a, a verse that um, I've spent years thinking about and... Um, it's something in my own heart and mind that I desperately need. There was a, there was a time early in my ministry when I felt very, very dry. I'd been preaching for two or three years, and, and it just, you know, I, I felt horrible uh, going through the motions. And uh, God brought to me a sermon by uh, George Whitfield that I read, and it was so full of Christ. And uh, my eyes were opened, and... I was reading Martin Lloyd-Jones' biography that time, and he tells the story about a man coming up to him saying, you know, man, your sermons are great, but Christ, you need Christ. And, and so those things converged, and God exposed to me. You know, I went back and looked at my sermons, and 
yeah, uh, I was assuming Christ. And so from that point on, uh, the Lord's helped me to be sensitive. It's not that I've never forgotten since then, but he's helped me to be sensitive to it. And these last few years have been difficult in trying to engage issues that I just, we can't be quiet about. You know, I, I think silence, at least on my part, I felt I would be guilty if I didn't speak and didn't try to say things and try to address issues and help people think about it and think about it rightly myself. And in the midst of that, there's a combativeness that can come about. And, um, and I know that I'm prone to falling into the temptation of wanting to win arguments more than winning people. And when that happens, I'm not remembering Christ. And I think what we've lived through the last few years is only preface for what we're about to face. And so as we were thinking about the theme, um, there's nothing that I could think of that would be better than for us to consciously, intentionally at the beginning of this year to call people together and say, brothers, sisters, we're Christians. You know, we, we belong to Jesus. We have a savior. He did shed his blood for us. And so what we do, we do in the name of Christ, in behalf of Christ, representing Christ, remembering Christ. So all of that's kind of long background and immediate uh, background to what I hope. And thus far, I'm sensing uh, the Lord would do in our time together. Yeah, you know that, um, that story of Martin Lloyd-Jones and that exhortation, I think from an older, more seasoned preacher when it was still early on in Lloyd-Jones Ministries, I think he was still at Sandfields. That story came to mind, Costi, as you were preaching last night. Um, and, you know, if something like that can happen to Lloyd-Jones, who is, you know, an expositor, he's faithful, he's reformed, yet a seasoned minister can still come to him and say, you know, your, your sermons are Christless. It just makes me think that, you know, how, how easy that is even for conservative, faithful, otherwise, you know, evangelical, Calvinistic uh, pastors can fall into that same trap. So, Costi, I'm wondering, you know, are there subtle temptations uh, to those who would even be sensitive to this kind of thing, uh, that they can fall into that trap to, to, in preaching sermons that seem faithful, yet aren't, they don't have Christ. Yeah, I, I'll speak from maybe the last two years. We planted a church in the Phoenix area, and the more you get to know people in your congregation and the more you're living life with them, uh, you get in the pulpit and preach, I think, exhortative sermons that you want to hit their heart so that they walk in obedience and they do what Christ has commanded. And I think in that, I've, I would echo what you just said, Tom, and how we can all forget. I think sometimes I would fall into patterns of just pressing in on the imperatives and wanting them to walk in obedience and be holy. And I'm giving that and forgetting maybe the indicatives or not coming back around to add in the gospel uh, we preached through the book of Ephesians for the kind of the foundational uh, year and a half or so of our church plant. And, you know, I always forget that these letters are probably read in one sitting. And so I'm living in one verse with mm -hmm. imperative commands and pressing in hard. And, you know, people are coming up after and maybe tearing up and they feel guilty and ashamed. Like, oh, that's me. And, and we're living in that for weeks on end. And as a preacher, I think the temptation is to forget the first three chapters and our job my job was in chapters four five and six to keep pulling back the beauty of christ and redemption and his grace and all he's done and the love of christ towards his people so maybe that would be the main temptation uh, for me potentially a secondary one would uh, be to get so fired up about the challenges or uh, false teaching or about what the culture's doing and spending more time hammering that and calling people maybe to arms in a sense spiritually and to get out there and, and stand strong for Christ, but then forgetting uh, what Travis preached on and the, the meekness of Christ and gentleness and a winsomeness and a wisdom and a calmness. And I think in our youth, especially mine, uh, you can get fired up and, you know, I'm going to kind of, you go a till of the hun, like we're going to do it, take it by force. And you realize the older, wiser men are just a little more measured because they've been there. And so the temptation to forget the Lord and say, we've got to do it ourselves would be maybe another one. Yeah, there seems to be, 
maybe somewhat, it feels like there can be contradictory messages to those uh, people who are in ministry, pastors. They want to be faithful to preach the word, and they want to be faithful to preach Christ. Uh, and so we often hear, you know, you, you need to preach the text. You need to preach what's in the text. Don't add things to the text that you want to preach. You know, let's not engage in eisegesis. Let's engage in exegesis. But for those who want to be faithful to preach Christ and also preach the text, how do ministers preach texts that there's not any obvious allusion to Christ? You know, I think, for instance, of Genesis 38 and the slaughter of the Hivites. You know, how do you preach Christ yet you preach the text at the same time. I mean, can, can you guys give some wisdom to ministers who struggle with those questions? Joel can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think the example you want to look to here preeminently is the Apostle Paul. Every problem he addressed in all the churches, the answer uh, just take 1 Corinthians. There's seven layers of criticism he gives them, and, he, and he's, he's dealing with seven problems. The answer to every single problem was Jesus Christ. All roads lead to Rome, as the ancient saying. For Paul, all roads lead to Christ. There is a way to Christ from every text, also Genesis 38. There's a way. That's the amazing grace of God, uh, even in, in the most horrendous circumstances. Mm. And so... As you preach over a number of years, uh, it becomes more and more real. What Spurgeon said is, you, you can't call it a sermon if you don't get to Christ. You know, every sermon must 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 get to Christ. So we have a, I had a lady, very very dear lady, very blunt lady, one of these Dutch feisty ladies, and um, she came up to me just a few months ago after a sermon, shook my hand. She said, you know, I've been thinking about your preaching. And she said, I, I decided you really bring us the same message every single week. <laughs> I go, oh boy, she's, gonna really be, she's really going to give it to me, right? And I said, uh, yeah. And she said, you just keep preaching Jesus. I go, yeah. And then she sighed and she said, but you know, somehow we just need to hear about Jesus every week. I thought that was beautiful. You see, mm -hmm. you're living seven days, six days out in the world. You're coming to church Sunday. It's high time to hear a message about Jesus. I mean, this message we just heard from my dear brother, Conrad. This is the essence of the gospel. If there's any of you here that don't know Jesus, I mean, listen again to that. Don't run away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You need him. But if you're a Christian, it's the same thing. You've got to just drink from this well over and over again. Every day. For me to live is Christ, Paul said. And to die is gain. Why gain? Because I'm in Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's not about the minister. It's not about anything else. It's just showing sinners the need for Jesus, showing them the riches of Jesus, alluring them to Jesus, and praying the Holy Spirit will just implement it. Mm. Amen. You know, the scriptures, or Jesus says, all the scriptures testify of me. And on the road to Emmaus, he started Old Testament, worked through to proclaim himself. And so when I'm at a text, like one of those you mentioned, Genesis 38, and I'm struggling to think, man, where's Jesus in this? I know the problem's with me because Jesus said, this text is about him. And so I can't finish my study. I'm not ready until I make those connections. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes um, we get the wrong idea of what proper biblical interpretation is and what proper exegesis is. And we can look at a guy like Charles Spurgeon and you're like, how did you get that out of that text? Like, yeah, that's good stuff. I'm glad you said it, but it doesn't come from the text. But I think that if, I think he was thinking more properly about the way to properly interpret texts often than, than we are. Um, Conrad, it was a wonderful sermon that you just delivered on, on the death of Christ. And you know, especially in the 20th century, but even today, uh, people have a very difficult time with this um, theory of the atonement, uh, penal substitutionary atonement. And they think that uh, it is inherently unjust for someone, even voluntarily, 
to pay the debt for someone else's crimes, to pay the penalty for someone else's crimes. You know, even C.S. Lewis had major questions in his own mind about this. I was just, recently I was listening to Dennis Prager, who, you know, the one reason he can't become a Christian is because he thinks it's so unjust to think that someone could pay for his own sins. He's got to pay for his own sins. So what would you, uh, what would you say to critics who, who think that it's unjust that, that someone would pay for the crimes of another? Yeah. Uh, are we using this or that? Uh, I think the handheld. The handheld, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think the basic answer to that is um, the fact that there is a covenant that God entered into, first of all, with our four parents, which, strictly speaking, nobody argues about because it's the reality. It's, it's, we are born sinners we are born under God's wrath because of our four parents, Adam and Eve. So that federal relationship is one that brings us into the world already owing God something. And uh, it's easy to illustrate it. Uh, you, a child is born in a country like America and is already being told that, you know, as a nation, we, we have this much debt. Maybe it's in trillions or something, uh, which we still we need to handle. So you can't say, well, what's that got to do with me? I was born yesterday. You are connected to those uh, who are your, your federal heads. So in the same way, uh, Jesus Christ is the last Adam. So you've got your first Adam and we've come into the world and there is a, a debt that we need to deal with. Um, Romans 5, in fact, verse 12 onwards, brings that truth out. Um, and then you've got your, your last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, who in fact pays the debt on behalf of his posterity. And again, that only makes sense. So whoever it is who is speaking in terms of I can only deal with my own sin, nobody can, I, I would want to ask him whether he knows anything of the law of inheritance. Because even him, he probably inherited something from his parents, or when he dies, he will pass something on to those uh, who are his posterity. That's just the way God has made us. We don't drop from the skies, each one of us independently. We are interconnected. And that's what God has done in bringing about our salvation. So it's not just a volunteer, but it is a federal head. Mm. That's what Jesus Christ is. Would somebody uh, define for the conference what the penal substitutionary atonement is? That's you, Phil. Your phone's ringing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the word penal means uh, it has to do with a penalty. The penalty of sin, of course, is death. And I would say to Dennis Prager or anyone else who holds that position, do you really think you can pay that penalty? The problem is the penalty of sin is too great for any of us to pay. So it's only the mercy of God uh, that he sent his own son to pay that penalty on our behalf. I can see why someone operating with just common sense and human reason might think there's something not right about that, that Christ paid such a high price for something he didn't deserve to pay. But understand, he did it willingly. Uh, it was the plan of God from the beginning, uh, and I'm glad he did, even though uh, it, it, it's more than I would do, you know. Uh, and, in, and I think that's what people like Dennis Prager are thinking. It, it seems unjust because it, I would think that was unfair if I was asked to pay the penalty for someone else. But Christ did that willingly. And so uh, rather than uh, stumble over the seeming injustice of it, I think we ought to marvel at the grace behind it. Mm. Uh, yeah, and you asked me to define it. Uh, what was a penal substitution? The word penal has to do with the penalty and substitution means 
he takes that penalty as our proxy. Uh, he, he is our substitute in every way. Not only the penalty, but I, I believe uh, what Scripture teaches is that uh, Christ was actually our substitute in his life. He was born under the law, Paul says in Galatians 4.4, 4, uh, meaning that he was subject to the law of God, and he obeyed it perfectly. And so not only does he erase the debt of my sin, he provides for me a righteousness through his own obedience as a man to the law of God. His righteousness is imputed to me. And so um, I have a right standing before God on that basis. Uh, without penal substitution, you really don't have the doctrine of justification by faith. Without the doctrine of justification by faith, you don't have the gospel. Yeah, there's an interesting thought of Jonathan Edwards here that someone like Dennis Prager, if it, I know, I, I would, I would say this to him as well. Edwards is saying, you know, someone like that, and that's our nature, doesn't realize the magnitude of sin. There's no way you, you as a finite being can pay an infinitely holy God. So if satisfaction is ever going to be brought in, it needs to be from someone who's infinite, which can only be God. So there's no other way for God to be satisfied than by God, a God-man. Only infinity can satisfy infinity. And so God allows Jesus to be, or decrees Jesus to become man, but he's not a, a two people. He, he, he's a divine person still. So his satisfaction is infinite. Mm. That, that's a key thing. And then that answers and, the, the charge of, you know, is this cosmic child abuse? Yeah, this is the only way to be saved. Praise mm -hmm. God, you know. You just don't. It's like Bozo in Anselm in the Middle Ages. When Bozo's, Anselm's trying to teach his student the gospel, and he can't understand why Jesus had to pay such a high price and why it had to be Jesus. And finally, Anselm gets very frustrated with him. He says, Bozo, he said, the reason you don't understand the magnitude of grace is because you don't understand the magnitude of sin. So once we understand the magnitude of sin, then we realize it's, like you said, it's helpless and hopeless, and it's only, only Christ. And what, what Conrad just said about, about the, uh, the covenant is really important too. Like, if I could just say this, Thomas Goodwin has this incredible illustration. He said, picture two huge giants with big belts around their waist, with millions of holes in their belts. He said, when we're born, we're hooked on to the first Adam's belt. He's the first giant. And when we get regenerated, what the Holy Spirit does is he unhooks us from the first Adam, and he hooks us on to the belt of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's no one in the world that is not hooked on to one of those two belts, Romans 5, right? Just an illustration of what you said. You've got, you're either in one or the other. So the question is, is the first Adam still your head, and are you, are you living out of him? That's hopeless. Is the second Adam your head? That's hopeful. <laughs> you're safe and you're secure if you're hooked into the belt of the second Adam. I want to underscore what you said about Anselm and, and the, the seriousness of sin. I think he says in that same place that if we understood the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin, we would not be willing to commit the slightest sin if by doing so we could save the whole world. And if you're not thinking of sin that way, the atonement and what Jesus did on the cross is not going to compute to you or it's not going to reach you the way it ought to. So I, I think one of the best things we can do in our, our culture is help people understand sin, which is to show them the righteousness of Christ, but also to preach the law of God in all of its strictness, in all of its... Uh, requirements in, in it's the spiritual dimensions of it. It's not just what we do. It's what we think. It's what we are. It's our desires. God requires that inwardly of us and nobody does it. And the slightest sin is worthy of eternal damnation because of the nature of God. And we've missed that. So we got to preach the truth about God and the truth about sin. Mm -hmm. Uh, Phil, yesterday you put on a clinic yesterday in Christology, and uh, it was wonderful to hear. But, you know, the hypostatic union, the incarnation, these Christological doctrines are, are very difficult to 
wrestle with. Um, they're very difficult to fully comprehend. And so what counsel would you give perhaps the layperson or even the minister here who still struggles to, to comprehend these things? How have you wrestled through these issues, these Christological issues, um, and what tools perhaps can they use to, to wrestle with them as well? Well, read a lot, okay? Um, and it's sad. I think, I think part of the problem today is evangelicals for, uh, I would say, 150 years have not been uh, known for teaching doctrine well. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a book, Banner of Truth, published in the 1950s. Uh, it was a reprint of a book by, uh, I think, James Buchanan on justification by faith. And J.I. Packer wrote the foreword to it. And in it, he said, uh, since this book was originally published in the 19th century, there has not been a single important work on the doctrine of justification by faith that has come from evangelical authors. Uh, so it was 100 years, he was talking about, 100 years of uh, drought on that doctrine. And Packer went on to say, uh, if that were the only thing you knew about the past 100 years, you'd be justified in concluding that it's been a, a period of spiritual lethargy, he said, or something like that, uh, that it's a time when the church is backslidden and in bad shape. And I think that's true. Now, we've had m more books in recent years, more focus on justification by faith, but on other uh, core doctrines, the, the incarnation of Christ, the doctrines of the Trinity and all that, there, there really hasn't been a lot of important uh, writing over the past hundred years. So what you've got are churches full of evangelicals who've never really been taught and who therefore don't see the importance of it. They're like, I've never heard this before. How could that possibly be important? Well, it is important. And so uh, my suggestion would be to read and go back and read some older authors and what they, what they had to say about uh, the Trinity and the incarnation of Christ and the doctrine of justification. Um. You know, the, you, you pointed out yesterday a lot of different Christological heresies that the church has seen over the centuries, particularly in the first five, six centuries of the church. Um, but, you know, we want to think about where we are in our context and even within our own camp of reformed evangelicalism. Are there subtle Christological errors that you see cropping up even amongst ourselves that we need to be on guard against? Yes, and, and I should say, I said read, I should tell you what to read. I think uh, some of the best stuff is uh, historical theology, where you, you uh, in fact, uh, my favorite books is a two-volume set that Banner published, I'm trying to think of the author, he was a Scottish author. Yeah, William Cunningham, uh, who chronicles some of the doctrinal disputes. And I think if you understand how these issues, what the controversies were like in the early church, it helps get a better picture of what's going on today, what's not going on today, what needs to be said, and so on. Um, so I would also say use old creeds. You know, use the Apostles' Creed, use the Nicene Creed. Uh, let your people hear the language. That at least frames the argument yeah. and uh, can, can keep them from the ditches along the way. So I, I found that to be beneficial. I did a series a few years ago on the history of heresy. And um, I, I, it's, it's my, my thinking that there are really about four or five categories of heresy. And heresies never die. So all the old heresies come back, you know. Pelagianism comes back as uh, semi-Pelagianism and Arminianism. And, you know, if you, un if you understand the, the history of how these issues have been argued, I think it's easier to understand how to answer the problems today. And it's also easier to spot where the problems are, what's problematic about what somebody's teaching and that. Yeah, Tom, to your point, um, Phil, as you were preaching on the Incarnation, I was just on my New Founders app looking at the 1689 Confession, chapter 8, paragraph 2, and just tracking along. I mean, everything that you were preaching is just summarized in that short paragraph, uh, very condensed. 
Um, but even that short paragraph is just the, a repetition of Chalcedonian Christology. And so maybe, Tom, you could speak to um, not just the importance of creeds, but also confessions and, and even having confessions that are binding in the life of a Christian. Yeah, well, I, we dealt with this in the pre-conference, and so I would encourage every church to be robustly confessional. I think there's health in that, and not just adopting a confession and forgetting it, but teaching through it and making your people familiar with it, helping them to see how a, a good confession, a good catechism, it just it lives in you. I mean, it, it, it comes out of my preaching, and sometimes people will say, you know, man, we heard you talk about question so-and-so today, and I'm not consciously thinking about it. I'm just citing something that's in my mind. So those things that are time-tested, that summarize key doctrinal issues, they're valuable for a Christian. They're valuable for a church. And I would say to parents, man, if you hadn't started, uh, start right now catechizing your children. Teach them good catechisms. You will serve them well. You'll give them a framework you will give them hooks to put truth on. You'll give them lenses to view the world by, and it'll live with them, and it'll help you. I mean, that's, I spent a lot of time in classrooms. I don't know if I did anything that has been more lastingly valuable to me than catechize my kids. Uh, it has served me well over the course of my lifetime. Yeah, what a testimony and what a grace that uh, you, have, you accidentally preach the catechism as you preach, but then the congregation picks up on the question that you were thinking about subconsciously. That's right, and kids do it. Uh -huh. you know, and sometimes I'll ask kids to help me preach. You know, I'll just ask them the question, and <laughs> they'll shout the answer out. You know, and it's, it's just encouragement to me, encouragement to others as well. Mm. Back to the question I asked you that you didn't answer, Phil. <laughs> um, Christological errors... That, that can be subtle even in our own camp that we need to be on guard about. You want me to name them? Yeah. Well, I, it seems to me that the one that's made the probably the most aggressive resurgence is canonicism. The idea that Christ laid aside something or, or uh, something pertaining to his deity. Uh, as I said yesterday, I think what, he, what he laid aside, uh, if you use the language of Scripture itself, was his reputation. Uh, not his attributes, not his divine nature or any part of it. Uh, I think that I think the statement goes back to Augustus Strong, who said, who defined, uh, you know, Christ's emptying this way, self-emptying. He said uh, he laid aside, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting the exact words, but this is the idea. He, he laid aside the independent use of his divine attributes. Ryrie picked up on that, and so that was the definition that went through uh, evangelicalism. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it's, it, it's possible to defend that definition, but I think it's a, little, it's, it's a little misleading because it makes it sound like Christ was somehow limited as God during his incarnation. And one of the points I wanted to make yesterday was that's not the case. He didn't give up his deity or any of his prerogatives as deity, uh, he, what, what he did in order to set aside his reputation was take on humanity. So you could say the incarnation was actually m more uh, a case of addition rather than subtraction. And I think it, it seems to be hard for evangelicals to think that way. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, I think a lot of evangelicals stress the deity of Christ almost to the exclusion of his humanity, which is just as big a problem. So, I'm interested in pastors uh, in our circles. We, we've dealt with this even just recently where uh, folks are saying, you know, I, I know what the confession says. I know what the historical creeds say, but I read it this way. And so I'm staking my claim here, you know, this is what the Bible says. Kind of like those two guys you mentioned in your talk, that they'd come up with something nobody in 2,000 years has ever seen. And so, I mean, you guys facing that with people in your church or people you're talking to, uh, it's more and more, and it's almost like uh, there's, there's almost a sense of uh, feeling more spiritual. And, and, you know, I'm just not going along with the crowd here. I'm taking my stand. This is my Luther moment, you know, and, and uh, these kind of deals. Is that 
I'm facing it. You guys facing it? You know, what, what, what bothers me is some, some people belong to groups that are, they're actually studying the Bible, and it's a good thing what they're doing, but they're saying to one another, oh, don't look at any other books or any other confessions. It's you, you and me and the Bible, and how do you feel about the text? Well, I've been a preacher for 45 years, and I'll tell you, when I study for a sermon, I also look at what our forefathers say, I look at what the catechism, these people are just like, out of the blue, and just say, oh. and what happens is it usually ends up being a very subjective interpretation. And so that's one reason why I think that um, it's a good thing, you, you paved the way for me to say this. Um, in the Dutch tradition, we pr preach from the Heidelberg Catechism because the Catechism was written as a preaching tool so that over a period of two years, as it takes to go through it about, your church hears every single major doctrine of the Bible expounded in the context of the whole of Scripture. What that doctrine really means for the church. And so penal substitutionary atonement, for example, there's a couple Lord's Days devoted to that. So every year... Our people will hear a sermon specifically explaining penal substitutionary atonement. Well, that helps mature the congregation a lot in all the major doctrines. Now, I realize there are debates about how to preach the Heidelberg Catechism, and you always have to take a text, of course. But we need to hear also some topical preaching, which gives you the, what the whole of Scripture has to say about a particular subject. Mentioning that Bible study reminded me of a story Spurgeon told about uh, an Irish group that had a Bible study. He said, we, none of us know nothing and we all taught one another. You know, and, uh, <laughs> I think that happens a lot of times. Well, and not, not just a lot of times. I would say the majority of uh, evangelical, at least self-described evangelical Bible studies these days consist of people sitting in a circle saying, what does this text mean to you? And they're concerned with what it means to me rather than what does it actually mean? What did it mean to the Holy Spirit when he inspired it? That's the question to ask. In an, in an environment, I think, of uh, a lot of ignorance, uh, evangelical ignorance for centuries now, and a not very many people reading, um, I think people are more informed by popular culture and uh, what they're, you know, this series, The Chosen. I haven't seen one episode of The Chosen, but... Uh, it's, the, it's produced by Mormons, and I think it's Dallas Jenkins, who's the director on the series. And I find a, an unnerving number of professing Christians who watch this thing faithfully, and they're, it's, it's, it's creating a Christ who is not the Christ of Scripture, but a Christ who had to, you know, kind of practice the Sermon on the Mount a few times before he could get it down and then go deliver it or uh, a Christ who seeks advice from his disciples or um, kind of is corrected by his disciples on some things and has to then go and it, that's, that's what's going on in the series. It's, it's making Christ in their own image and then marketing him and turning him into a commodity or a product. That's happening, it, whether it's a uh, uh, slick and highly produced like that, or if it's done just in a podcast, you've got you've got uh, you know a whole group of in the man, you know the manosphere of the universe or of the of the internet that are um, you know they're disaffected, angry young men who want to create uh, in create a Christ who is just as angry as they are about the same issues that they are, and so they uh, they find in Christ whatever they make him out to be, and it justifies their their anger or justifies their rage. So that, that's, I'm, I'm dealing with that, I think, on a, just a popular level of just a lot of ignorance. And then it is these guys, a few guys with their Bibles, um, coming up with things that is just totally detached from church history, totally detached from theology. In my context, you know, with dealing with some young people and just newer believers uh, and some of the movements that are out there, maybe one of the most attractive things is people thinking that they've got something new. And so the idea of being original is really attractive to people today. And so you have, you know, a host of, of younger influencers and kind of pastors, maybe in quotes, who are on Instagram. And the goal is to be as unique and as novel and as attractive as you can be. So you'll get 
you know, movements like Bethel and kind of all the spinoffs of that who are promising you something that you've never experienced before, or they'll use words like unprecedented, or we're taking things to a whole new level. And they'll often use other movements or other eras as sort of their straw man. So this isn't your granddaddy's church. This isn't your old Baptist church. This isn't your dead, you know, parents religion this isn't suits and ties so they'll throw that up there and young people look at that and think yeah and so if they're disillusioned with the church or they were offended by the clear preaching of the gospel or uh, a hard-lined kind of doctrinal church that said no this is what the text says they're attracted to something that now says well you can have freedom and you can discover this on your own and so we try to spend a lot of time you know plowing the field of their hearts with the truth, and also dealing with those movements effectively. But yeah, we tell a lot of the young people now, if it's new, it's probably not true. It's kind of the, the same thing we keep telling them. And number one issue is Bible studies. Here's what this means to me. What are you getting from this? And you got 18 different interpretations. It's interesting because you have that in Scripture with the Athenians. Luke says of the Athenians, they spent all their time doing nothing but looking for something new. And he doesn't mean that as praise. It's hard to convince evangelicals that that's not, that's not the way to be. And what you just said, too, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Spurgeon's friend Robert Schindler who wrote the downgrade articles, who said that very thing. In theology, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. Mm-hmm. Joel, in your your sermon last night on the authority of Christ, you talked about all human authority being derived, that we don't have inherent authority, but it's given to us uh, by God. And so you said that when someone exercises authority and they command you to do that which is against the command of God, well, it's an illegitimate exercise of of that authority and is not to be obeyed. Uh, My question is, you know, if someone is in a place of God-given authority and they're not necessarily commanded to do something which is contrary to God's commands, uh, but it does fall outside of the sphere or the realm or the jurisdiction of their own authority, are, are people still required to respond to that authority, authority and be obedient to that authority? So you gave the example of a, of a wife who responds to the authority of her husband and the husband says, you know, go rob this bank. And that's very clearly contrary to the command of Scripture. So she has a a responsibility to the authority of Christ over over her husband. But what if he commands her to do something that is outside of his own jurisdictional authority, um, but it's not necessarily black and white against a clear command that that Christ has given or the Word of God presents? Does she still have a responsibility to submit to his authority? Or you could extrapolate from that um, to, the, to the sphere of church and the authority of, of elders and ministers. Um, if they give a command that is not contrary to the word of God, yet it does seem to be arbitrary or without, outside the jurisdiction of their authority, are, are members still required to be obedient to that? Well... <laughs> There's, you know, I, th- I think I'll just speak in the terms of a general principle. Yes, in a general principle, every area has its own area of authority. So you're on to something very important. It's not always quite that black and white. I mean, you, wasn't it you mentioned the example of, uh, you know, a church office bearer can't tell you what color to paint your, paint your walls or something. Did you say that yesterday? I think it was you. Okay. Was it me? Oh, okay. But I mean, we say the same things that, pretty that often. Be, it, was, it was me, but I don't want to <laughs> okay. in the sermon. There's huge abuses of authority that can go on where, when people trespass their own boundaries. And you think you have the authority to tell people to do things just because you're a pastor, for example. It's a temptation for a pastor. Um, one danger of a pastor is that he starts acting like a medical doctor when he's, he's not. Uh, and tell people what to take for pills or something. Whoa, wait a minute. I'm not a medical doctor. This is not my area uh, of authority. So I direct them to a medical doctor. So in every area, I think people have to be careful. And so I think if, say, your wife and your husband tells you to do something that seems out of bounds, the wife needs to talk to her husband about that if she feels different in her conscience and need to come to, come, come to a solution. And 
sometimes it can get so severe when people trespass into other areas of authority that people need to get counseling to get clear vision of what is your authority and what is not your area of authority. Mm. Very good. Um, Travis, you referenced uh, in your talk that this year is an election year um, and seems as though you're anticipating uh, somehow upheaval and perhaps some, some conflict in various ways. I was wondering if you could gaze into your crystal ball and tell us <laughs> what we should be expecting, um, or maybe just what you anticipate, but also um, how we as Christians should be thinking uh, about the things that we might expect in the year 2024. Bullets and water. You want to stock up. <laughs> <laughs> We, food, we, food. We need lots of food, right? Dry food. We'll grow our food. I think Ali Bestucky was talking about. <laughs> what's that book on the garden? Yeah, getting the garden it. right, yeah. <laughs> getting the garden right. And there's someone here who can provide the soap. I hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Costi's got a user testimony on the soap that he was provided. Shout out to Miller's Grove. Go see him in the sponsor hall. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any crystal ball about what's going to happen. I just know it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, we've got to do our best to shepherd people through the decisions that they make. And uh, obviously they have a, a, they're, they're exercising a certain amount, amount of authority in their sphere of politics as they go cast votes. Uh, I think it's very important for us as pastors to help them think through the issues that are at stake uh, in politics. Um, but it is getting confusing, isn't it? It's a, it's a very difficult and talk about not things, not being black and white and getting in the, in the gray areas. Uh, that's certainly what we're facing in our country now. And you, you would expect that in a land that's been delivered over to the judgment of God, according to Romans one, you'd expect things to be absolutely confusing. And so a lot of times what you're left with is not a good and bad option, but you're just left with the least worst option is what you're trying to help people find their way to. So, uh, it's just going to be a time I think, and I think that, um, you know, just in, in my own thinking through meekness and seeing the meekness of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's a lot that he set aside and didn't, uh, didn't address. He didn't come to fix the politics of Jerusalem because he came as the preeminent politician, <laughs> not a politician in a sense. He's, a, he's an absolute dictator. He's, a, he's the uh, monarch who comes from on high, and, and yet he didn't sort out all those issues at that time. Um, so I, I, think we, I think we can back off and see a lot of things play out and know that things are going to Things are going to go maybe from bad to worse. Uh, but at the same time, walk with meekness through it. Keep our composure. Pray, pray, take our concerns and teach our people to take their anger and their fears and their anxieties and worries to the Lord in prayer. But then get up from your knees in prayer and go and do what you can to affect change in the culture uh, according to the sphere that God has given you. Um, if you have people in your congregations that are... Uh, involved in politics, man, got to support them, pray for them, help them. Uh, that's what we do as pastors is try, just try to make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded and certainly to do that in the political sphere. So I don't know what else I can say besides that at this moment, but I certainly can't predict uh, the outcome of this upcoming election. That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let me just quickly add a word to that. And it's the fact that while you are sitting at the edge of your seats of uh, the um, American election, just bear in mind that a little more than 50% of the world's population will be going through elections this year. So it's a major event globally. And it will be good for you as American Christians to sort of peep a little bit beyond your, your fence and <laughs> pray for the rest of the world, um, politically as well. Um, you, you may have your tense moments here, but in a lot of the uh, different parts of the world, it, democracy is still extremely new, it's fragile. People you know, end up killing one another. 
uh, and it's your brothers and sisters in the Lord who are caught in the crossfire. So please pray for the world as well. Thank you. Comrade, what are you facing in Zambia this year? Well, I mean, for us, thankfully, we don't have an election year uh, within our own country of Zambia. I think it's, it's more just the, the usual um, economic meltdown that tends to, you know, keep happening, uh, frustrating uh, so much of our own gospel work, missions work, primarily because of uh, resource issues. Uh, but as I said, thankfully, we don't have elections in Zambia. I was in uh, Lusaka during one election, presidential election, and it was everyone said it was stolen. And so they were issuing statements, stay off the streets. I had to get to the airport. And uh, it was difficult to get to the airport. And so, I mean, that, yeah. but the people I was talking with, you and others, it's like, yeah, here we go again. Yes. Type of thing. yes. Well, all over the world today, we, we, we've got to be, like you said, praying. We've got to be praying for a great awakening that's bigger than the original great awakening that we saw in America and the British Isles and so on. Because God knows how to come in the darkest times. And we're in, we're in one of the darkest times in the history of mankind in terms of insane ideas and departing from God. And God, God says in Deuteronomy, I'll come with my goodness to bring you to repentance. If that doesn't work, I'll come with my judgments to lead you to repentance. And if that doesn't work, I'll leave you over to yourselves. And that's the stage we're at in America today. God's leaving a good part of America, at least, over to itself. So all these insane ideas are going around and people are just going crazy with their, against God's created order. We're being left to ourselves. But in the midst of darkness, I mean, my prayer daily is, Lord, don't let this nation entirely self-destruct, but remember the remnant in the land and spare this nation and come back and show thy might and thy power and revive us and send a great awakening greater than the original awakening. That's what we need. Yeah, and if I could just piggyback on that, God handing people over to the judgment of sexual immorality or homosexual immorality and depraved and debased mind in Romans chapter 1 each stage of handing over that judgment, giving them over to their sin or what they desire, is, is judgment. And it's meant to awaken their conscience to be so soaked in their sin that they wake up and say, what are we doing? What, what has happened to us? Why is my family destroyed? Why is my, my conscience defiled and to turn their eyes upward? And so if there's going to be an awakening... Certainly through prayer, but as we get up off our knees, we have to preach the word. We have to go deep with theology. The weakness in our country and in our churches is because of an absence of theology. It's because we try to make God too familiar, make him in our image, and make, man, make Christ too familiar. I, I understand that the Son of Man is fully human or truly human. He is both. But we need to see a transcendent God. We need to bow before a Christ who is, in, 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 in many ways, not like us. He is absolutely perfect, and we need to fall before his majesty and give worship and ob obeisance and praise and obedience to him. That's where the revival is going to come, is through theology and through strong, biblical, exhortative preaching of the word of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of what we see in our society, the, the cultural decay, we talked about it last night a little bit with, with Ali Beth, that the, the culture flows from cultists or from worship, from religion. And when we think about well, what do we do as Christians in this decaying culture that we live in, this culture that's been handed over uh, to its own base desires. And we, we can tend to think, okay, we gotta fight a culture of war uh, trying to change the culture. And there's something good about that, that's fine. Uh, but the culture war is fought through religion. The culture war is fought through worship. And I'm not saying, you know, take up a sword or anything, but go to church and worship Christ. That's how the culture war is fought because the culture is affected by those who worship in spirit and truth and they worship the true 
God. And so I think that that is incredibly important for us to think about, to not take our eyes off of what is most important as we go through political and cultural upheaval. Um, so as we continue to think about uh, the doctrine of Christ, uh, I just want each of you to give one, and Dr. Beeky, you can have two, uh, books that people... <laughs> Uh, books that you would recommend uh, on this issue of either uh, the doctrine of the person of Christ or the work of Christ. I'm going to start with you, Tom. Just one. Uh, I would say, I think Sinclair Ferguson's book, The Whole Christ. Yeah, well, that's why I went first. I want to do a... Um, because he deals with that whole marrow controversy in a way, and you get a lot. You get law, you get gospel, you get preaching. And so uh, if I had to use one book, The Whole Christ. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, I get two. Okay. I do give you two. <laughs> um, I, would, I would go first to the Puritan, Looking Unto Jesus by Isaac Ambrosi for, for just a, a very robust view of how Christ meets all your needs in every area of life and to really appreciate his full, full ministry. Um, you know, we just finished a systematic theology on, on, on Christology. So, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to um, pick from the hundreds of sources we referred to. But I think also don't forget to go to major systematic theologies that have been really rich in devotional material as well as doctrinal material. Um, Wilhelm Sabrocco, written in 1700, is still very, very relatable to today. The Christology section is just fantastic. And every little part, every little part of Christology, every chapter, he closes with all the practical applications for a Christian today. So... Yeah, there's a lot of good Christology volumes tucked away in systematic theologies. Um, there's one that I'd like to recommend, uh, especially because the whole issue of preaching uh, Christ from the Old Testament came up earlier. And that is uh, a banner book, banner of truth book, on um, uh, the Old Testament sermons by Martin Lloyd-Jones. I'd really like to recommend that for two reasons. One is that you are actually learning about Christ from the Old Testament. But number two, it's the fact that you're learning how to preach Christ from those same Old Testament uh, texts. Uh, it was a lifesaver for me a number of years ago when I was beginning to preach from Genesis and yeah, began to struggle with exactly what you raised earlier on. Uh, and then I can't remember who recommended it to me. And when I began reading it, about halfway through, it's like the light bulbs turned on. And uh, I, I've been helped since. So I'd like to recommend that Burn of Truth book. I really appreciate the writing of John Owen. Um, I, I know that it can be a, a sometimes difficult to work through, but I think that there's a, a pastoral heart that that tries to get to the the nub of the issues in theology and expose those to people with questions. So, and so, uh, one book that I'd like to recommend is the Death of Death and the Death of Christ. That is not only, I think, an unanswerable argument on particular redemption, but it's also, it shows the mind of God in providing the proper means to the ends that he predetermined. And so to see how, who God is and what he's like and how he sent Christ to not die for a way of salvation to purchase an, but to purchase an actual people. So that there is nothing to uh, solidify my assurance in an objective fact of what God has done than what he has accomplished in Christ. And then as if I could just sneak in a companion to that is communion. I'm not going to stop a Navy communion. SEAL. Communion. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't trade on that for a long time there. Uh, but uh, communion with God also by John Owen to worship God in his Trinitarian persons, Father, mm -hmm. Son, and Holy Spirit. And so 
those, those will give a high view of God and inspire, evoke our worship of God that just w- causes us to weather any storm. There's a lot of, I think, good devotional books and historical books, Puritan books. For me personally, the book that fortified my Christology was a book by Stephen J. Wellam called God Incarnate. And I needed to understand uh, what was heresy and what wasn't because I didn't, I needed, I wanted to stop believing heresy, let alone preach it. And um, what got me so fired up about Phil's session yesterday is, you know, he's, he's like a walking library. He's just unloading it. I'm going chapter four, chapter eight, page <laughs> 402, you know, I'm walking through it all. And um, so that book would be helpful if you're looking for a way to fortify your Christology and have a good, solid foundation. And then secondarily to that or part of that, it has a huge section on uh, canonicism. I think a huge issue we face today with, again, I mentioned the movement earlier, Bethel and a lot of the weird teaching out there, and people don't know where that comes from. These issues have been dealt with long before today. And so going back, he takes you through ontological, canonicism, functional, and classic views, and you can really make sure that you and the people you serve are clear on biblical and orthodox Christology. Yeah, all good recommendations. Uh, But if you want a simple, short book that's very helpful, I recommend Leon Morris um, called, I think it's The Lord from Heaven. The Lord from Heaven. It's a little paperback, but it's rich. Uh, And also, I thought you, when you brought up John Owen, I thought you'd say The Glory of Christ, which is so good. Hmm. Very good. That's two. (laughs) Sorry. Well, thank you so much, uh, speakers, for being here for this conversation. Please give our speakers a hand.